we're going to jump straight to a really interesting and compelling idea called Hyperloop, which is why we have Chris Vasquez to talk about that and other things that he is interested in. So please join me in welcoming our new friend, Chris. All right, gang, thanks to Jonah. Uh, that's better. Yes, okay, cool. All right, thanks for having me here. I'm pretty excited to talk to you guys about Hyperloop and what we're doing. Okay, so full disclosure, I am an engineer uh, and a SpaceX alum. I've been there for about, I was there for about nine years. Um, and it was about employee 150 of what I believe now is around 6,000. Uh, so pretty early days. Uh, while I was there, I was responsible for uh, the birthing mechanism on top of Dragon. I uh, kind of founded and led the materials and contamination groups there. And the last major thing I did was uh, architect a custom materials database. We call that MARS. It's a pretty lame acronym, but it essentially means material attribute reference system. Anyways, we like MARS at SpaceX, so I kind of went with it. Okay, so enough about me. Let's talk about the Hyperloop here. So Elon Musk, generally credited with the idea of the Hyperloop, had this to say. He said it was a cross between a Concord a rail gun, and an air hockey table. Now, if you know of or about Elon, that's pretty classic for him. It's very to the point and very technical. Uh, to engineers, this makes perfect sense. To everyone else, you know, not so much. So we're going to try again. So what is Hyperloop? It's an integrated transportation system. Now, all integrated means is that we take functions that are traditionally buried in, like, the vehicle, and we split them between the vehicle and the infrastructure. Um, we use linear electric motor technology, magnetic levitation to hurl pods through basically anything, anywhere through this ultra controlled environment at very high speeds. And when I say high speeds, I'm talking in excess of about 700 miles an hour. It, let me give you a little bit of a breakdown here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go mobile here. All right, so one of the things that, that confuses a lot of people is this is the direction of travel here. So this compressor, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we need a compressor in such a low pressure environment. Uh, this is actually the front of the vehicle, so imagine it going this way. Now, one of the, I guess, more distinguishing features of the Hyperloop is this contained environment, wh what everybody calls the tube. And what looks to be at first a really constraint or, or something that's very confining actually gives us a lot of freedom. Uh, with that tube, we are no longer affected by weather. We have a lot of flexibility in our route selection, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And because we keep it at such a low pressure, uh, we free ourselves from the friction and the things that slow every other mode of transportation down. All right, so when I say anything, I mean cargo and people mainly. These are our two primary use cases. Uh, so I think what, because we have such a controlled environment, we can actually tailor this to the application. So for cargo, we can be pretty aggressive with our speeds and our, and our banking. Uh, with people, we can make that very grandma and pet friendly. Uh, if you've ever seen your dog ride with you in the car, he will agree that is not a pet-friendly environment. But what we can really do is, is tailor this to be a very specific uh, solution to the application we're using. So what you can start to realize here is that Hyperloop isn't one thing. It's actually a product line that, we, that, that we're developing. So we have three primary routes that we can go with the Hyperloop. And, and it's essentially above grade, so that's elevated on columns. And grade, for those who aren't familiar, grade simply just means the ground. This is like transportation lingo that I'm learning on the fly here. So we can go above ground. We can go below ground tunneling. So that's either below uh, land ground or even below the bedrock here underwater. Or we can actually just be submerged underwater. Um, I think the common theme between all of these is essentially that we're taking back the land. We're replacing the large footprint of existing infrastructures like roads. They're just massively wide, very two-dimensional taking up a lot of land, and we're moving Hyperloop up out of the way, or even better, out of sight underground. This underwater, this underwater route I actually like a lot. It has a lot of potential for ports, and I'll talk more about that right now. So if you've ever been to the port, um, or know of a port, it basically has two parts. It has a dock, and that's where all the ships come in, and you have a yard, which is simply just a fancy word for where I store all the stuff that I pull off the ship. Those ports 
take up a lot of room. They, get, they dominate the landscape they're in, and they dominate the skyline. If you've seen the cranes, they're huge. So what we can do with the Hyperloop is develop some kind of an offshore rig. So what this really is, is it's pushing the, the docks further out into the water. This could be even outside of our field of vision. And we're pushing the yards where it's taking up a lot of expensive real estate. Uh, it's very ugly and it's just concrete. And we can move that further inland. And so what that does is it clears up all the congestion of the, of, of the trucks that are coming into that to try to get that cargo and bring it to our homes. So that cleans up the air, the land, and it makes it livable again. So as an example, here's uh, the port of Marseille in the south of France. This is one of the largest ports in the country. Uh, frankly, this could be any port. This looks a lot like the port of Los Angeles. So you can see it's large, it's sprawling, very functional, but definitely very ugly as well. So with the Hyperloop, what we could do is we could take those, we could take those, uh, those docks, push them out. You can't really see because the graphics here, but this is that system we just showed you. And now we can take the ships, they're porting out there, they're not coming in here anymore, and they're hyperlooped inland, far inland, where there's less traffic, where you don't have to try to weave through the city. And now we're taking what is estimated to be about $200 billion of real estate, repurposing that and make it more livable. And that's, and that's even beneficial to the people who live around the port. All right, so I can tell in your eyes you want it, but do you really need it? Well. So this is a, it's a lot of stats on, uh, on traffic congestion and things like that. And I don't think this is telling you anything you didn't already know intuitively, uh, that the delays, there's congestions, there's bottlenecks, and it costs us time and money. Maybe not the money as far as like what you knew, but these are some pretty staggering values. Uh, one of the biggest, I, I think one of the coolest things I like about this slide is it, it, it says something about that in the biggest rail center, which is Chicago, it takes a train longer to get from one side of the city to the other than it actually would that same train to get from Chicago to Los Angeles. And I think that speaks to the fact that we're kind of consuming, we're just reaching our capacity for the existing infrastructure. And that's not even the worst part of it. Emissions are continuing to rise, and as these containers and these trucks and these trains get bigger, when these incidents happen, they affect more people, especially because the roads are becoming more crowded as we grow. And now for the bad news, it's, it's getting worse. And I think, I think it's important to say that this isn't really a failure of our existing infrastructure. This is just what happens when we grow and we prosper. We need more and we consume more. So what are, how do we reconcile this? We want to grow and we want to prosper. But as we do so, we continue to stress our infrastructure to the point where it's breaking. So what is the future of transportation? With the Hyperloop, you get direct to destination transport. So it's not, imagine pushing a button like I'm going to a floor on a building, and I'm going from one location to another. And this is not from airport to airport. This is city center to city center. It's packetized transport. So instead of this communal, larger trains, larger buses, larger planes, we're fitting more and more people on there. We're able to fit fewer people on there because we can go so fast. And that's one of the beauties that speed really affords you. Um, it's not more people less often, it's less people more often. And because we travel in such a small pod, we can personalize that. I think that's one of the reasons people love their cars is because it's, it's an expression of them. Um, with this, we can start to tailor that experience uh, to be more personal, more bespoke, more unique. And I think that will uh, help the traction of this system. It's kind of hard to see here, but on the, on the bottom right, you kind of have a... A, a, a metric, a comparison, and I really apologize for the graphics here, but this is like cost, speed, safeness, weatherproof. And you can kind of see on the far right is Hyperloop and how we stack up against the other modes of transportation. All right, so I'm ready to geek out a little bit. Uh, feel free to tune out if you're not really a gearhead or you don't like tech so much. So I, first and foremost, we can build the Hyperloop today. There, there's, it's just expensive. And when it's expensive, it's exclusive. And we at Hyperloop are not okay with that. This, the computer didn't change the world until it got out of universities and out of institutions and got into everyone's home. And that only happened when it became affordable. This is not the internet for some, it's the internet for all. And so we're gonna dive down a little bit more into what we're doing, but essentially in a nutshell, we're innovating on cost. And it's the cost to build it and the cost to operate it. 
So this is kind of a breakdown of Hyperloop in a subsystem way. Um, I, think, I think the point to take away from that graphic specifically is that this is the level of integration that's required. One of the things we do at Hyperloop internally is we actually focus a lot on route development. Um, so you can see that route development takes into account elevation, uh, turn radius, and also rights of way. Again, we talk about rights of way, meaning you know, rail and highway, they connect two points, but they actually divide everything in between. The, the right of way just means how difficult is it for me to cross a highway. Um, if it was easy, Frogger wouldn't be such a great game. So essentially, you can see here that look at the different geographies that we have here, and notice that the optimal solution for cost and speed isn't necessarily a straight line. So this is our infrastructure, um, and this is next-gen stuff. I mean, what we're doing here is we're, we're developing a system that talks to the pod, and it talks to us, and these things are all interacting. And these are, these are full-scale tubes out in Nevada right now. So this is not just graphics. This is not just uh, pretty pictures. Uh, I was in Vegas a couple days ago looking at this. These are 15-meter long tubes, 3-meter long. I'm sorry. I got to go U.S. here, like 10 foot diameter, 30 feet long. I'm in meters because that's what we're doing. Um, I won't talk too much about it, but just recognize that this is the scale of some of the stuff we're talking about. So those are people down there. So pod development. So this compressor here, even at very low pressures, and I can equate low pressure to kind of an altitude. If you want to say like the higher I go, the more I'm approaching space, the lower the altitude gets. We still need the compressor to help reduce drag, and that's so that our energy goes further. You know, we want to use a lot less energy. We're, we're not having to overcome the air, but even at these high speeds and low pressure, there's still air there. So that pressure, that, that compressor is kind of helping to consume the air and route it back behind us. Only problem is nobody's ever built a compressor to operate that low, so there's no data for us. So what do we do? We build our own low pressure wind tunnel. That took about 10 weeks to build, that's really fast for people who don't know. Um, and that's so unique that I think uh, NASA is even hitting on our doorstep to uh, try to figure out how to use it to characterize their Martian uh, helicopters. I think that's what they're doing. Pretty wild stuff. So levitation. So this is actually pretty cool, too. Uh, traditional maglev systems have to power the entire track to achieve this magnetic levitation that gets at really low friction. We're developing a passive system. And so what that means is that for longer stretches, probably about 90 to 95% of our track doesn't require power. And that is also another way that we're able to keep the cost low. And we hope that that will uh, allow more infrastructure to be built at a faster pace. So our, our propulsion is essentially a linear electric motor. Um, if you're familiar with Tesla, they use a rotary electric motor. So it just spins a shaft round and round that turns your wheels round and round. All we did was cut that in half, spread it out, and we're using that to shoot the pods at extremely high, uh, high velocity. Speed, sorry, velocity is an engineering word. Um, this is pretty cool. This is kind of a, a, an in-depth look. It's called the Halbach Array, and all this is meant to do is be uh, a series of magnet orientations that really focus um, the repulsion to a certain way, and that just gives us more ride height, and it's a more comfortable ride for you. So looking ahead, this is actually happening this month. Uh, this is Vegas, so this is the amount of progress we made. We got this land in December. Here it is in January. We're about to test our propulsion system outside the tube, and I think, I think the point in this slide and the next slide is that this is not happening in 2030. This is not happening in 2040. This is happening now, this year. And so this is the pace at which we want to develop this solution. Later on this year, we're going to actually build a full-scale, full-speed, development loop. Again, we're trying to achieve very high speed. So this will be uh, about a two kilometer track and we're going to be shooting some stuff in there very fast. I'm pretty stoked to see what happens. Again, this is happening at the end of the year. So if you know anything about the company, we were founded in 2014 and less than two years later, we have a full scale track out in Nevada. Again, it's happening today. I like this, this slide a lot because one of the things that people think about immediately when you think of the Hyperloop and the tube is like, that's a lot of infrastructure to have to build. Is it possible? Well, in the 1800s, they went, starting in 1860, this is kind of a graphic of uh, how pervasive the rail system was. And in 30 years, using 1800s tech, they were able to expand that infrastructure out. I think we can do this at a much faster pace today. And so I feel like that argument doesn't hold a lot of water anymore. And I think on a personal note, 
you know, when people ask me, like, what is the Hyperloop? There's, there's the objective side of that, which is everything I just told you. And then there's the very personal side. And I feel like our generation is where we are today because our, our fathers and our forefathers solved the problems of yesterday. You know, we're using trains, we're using planes, we're using cars. And it's our generation has an obligation to contribute to the advancement of civilization. And not just in an idea sense, not just in, in a thought sense, but a physical solution. And the Hyperloop for me is a promise to my kids that they will not have to make the choices that I have to make about living close to work or living far away from work. I, I just don't want them to have to struggle to choose family or work the way I've had to choose. And I'm, I'm making a lot of sacrifices right now and I'm not gonna, uh, uh, all right, I'm shaking it off. I'm making a lot of sacrifices right now to bring this to fruition because I know their life can be better and this is gonna happen but I am still of this generation, which means I'm not going to wait. So we're going to do this today because I don't want to wait and, and not see the fruits of my labor until tomorrow. And that's the end.